this. And so, um, so this is kind of, it's kind of good for me. I know it's probably kind of frustrating for you guys to not have it all up there, but, but it just sort of keeps me in practice for, you know, when the Lord opens a door for us to be able to go back. But so we've been moving through that whole of the book and adding all this stuff, you know, the genius of God in Genesis, the Maseroth, uh, you know, the gospel in the stars idea, um, the tabernacle. We could go on and on, and we've just been adding all of that stuff. And I realized, really, as I've been thinking over this over the past few days, I realized that everything that we've been talking about um, is really about Jesus as, as Redeemer, as Savior. And though we do talk about it, it's sort of, uh, it's sort of not in the priority, and, and that is about His return. Not as, not as the Savior, but as the Sovereign. You know, in other words, not as the Redeemer, but to rule. And though we do talk about that, it's really important because if you, I was thinking about this and I'm thinking, well, you can't have a whole of the book study if you don't understand the idea of Jesus coming that first time for redemption and then the promise that he's going to return to rule. You, you can't do that. And so that's really what I wanted to go off on uh, and we would have begun tonight. And I got it out of the, uh, the book of... Um, uh, uh, book of Revelation, chapter 19, where it talks about the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. So this idea of the proclam proclamation of all, and of course this is the last book, almost the last chapter of the book, in the whole of the book, um, and it's talking about that Jesus, uh, the testimony of who Jesus is, what he's done, what he's yet to do, all of those things are, uh, are the very spirit itself of all of the proclamation, because remember, prophecy is proclamation. Um, and of course, that has to do with future, because we're talking about his return, and he hasn't come back yet, so that's, those are, that's, you know, uh, that's futuristic in that, in that sense. And so that's kind of what I, what I wanted to do for, you know, tonight, and to look at that. So we've really focused on bringing all of these things together. We've really focused on the Moedim in the, in the, the feasts of Israel, and, and looked at them from that first perspective with the spring, right, with the Passover, unleavened bread, first fruits, and then 50 days later, Pentecost. And those are all talking about Jesus in the first coming. And again, this is where we've gotten into the, the, the last three, which we just finished with last month um, in uh, September, was the, uh, what are called the fall Moedim, or the fall appointed times. And they are, of course, trumpets, day of atonement, and tabernacles. And we touch on that and we talk about how he's, you know, the, the, these, are, these are unfulfilled. And so Jesus is going, you know, as if he's, he was that accurate with the spring, you know, to the day, then this is what we can look at. And so that sort of springboarded into this, uh, this sort of this next area. So we're going to take a look and sort of move through um, the scripture and see that uh, that really the kingdom was, you know, in the heart of God the entire time, once sin enters the picture with the fall. So we're going to look at some of those prof prophecies, which we've already seen, that talked about the, that Jesus, both as redeemer on the one line, but then also as king. And what you find when you, when you dive into this kind of stuff is that uh, the Old Testament, though it's clearly there for the, that the Messiah would be Redeemer. I mean, all you got to do is think of Isaiah 53, Psalm 22, right? Um, Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, with the seed of the woman. Um, so clearly the idea of a Redeemer was there, but the overwhelming uh, perspective of the Old Testament was in fact the kingdom that Messiah, the promised Messiah, would come and would establish his kingdom. And so that's really sort of the, the, sort of the, the train we're going to look at. And we know that the whole of the scripture does that because uh, Jesus told the guys on the road to Emmaus uh, that very thing, you know, uh, because their confusion was they, they were, everybody was looking for, including the, uh, including the apostles themselves, were looking for Jesus to be the Messiah. They believed he was the son of David, but their understanding was sort of one-sided. 
And it's easy to understand because if you're the apostles and, or your parents, you know, the apostles' parents, grandparents, great-grandparents, the nation of Israel from the time of Babylon has been subject to all of the nations, right? When we, in our study in the book of Daniel, we're looking at um, how uh, the Babylonians came in, took the Jews captive, right? It took them over to uh, Babylon, destroyed the temple, um, and created all kinds of problems. And from that point on, the scripture is very clear that that initiated what Paul in Romans 11 identifies as the times of the Gentiles, right? The Jews were in their homeland with their temple on Zion, which we've talked about on Sunday mornings again. They had all of that. Well, all of a sudden now Babylonian, Babylon has come in, has destroyed that. It's gone. And so the people of Israel from that day on have been subservient to all of the nations and all of the empires of the nations. We know from Daniel that following the Babylonians, you had the Persians, and then they got control. And then from the Persians, the Greeks got control. And then from the Greeks, the Romans got control. And then Rome divides, and, and then you get the, the, Byzant, the, the Byzantine Empire. And then after the Byzantine Empire, it's the Ottoman Empire. And all of these nations, all Gentile, not uh, descendants of Abraham, all of these nations have been in control of the city of Jerusalem, and in particular, the Temple Mount, and therefore have, 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 had the, you know, have had control of the Jewish people. That changed for the first time since Babylon, 586 BC. That changed in 1948. For the first time, the people, since the days of Babylon, the first time the Jews are the Jews. And they're back in their land. There's a nation of Israel, which failed to exist from the times of the Babylonians. There were the Jews, but they were under Roman control and Greeks and the Persians and stuff. There wasn't a nation, and that did not change until 1948. And then in 1967, they would get control of the Temple Mount. They would now control Jerusalem itself. And to save, you know, to, to create, uh, to save themselves from even, you know, more problems, they went ahead and they gave the country, uh, well, actually it was the other nations, but along with uh, the agreement from Israel, they gave the Jordanians control of the Temple Mount. And they put the Temple Mount under the control of the Jordanians under what is called the Waqf. And so it's the Jordanians now that are responsible for the Temple Mount. So when you just saw here uh, for the Feast of Trumpets, for an example, and you, I don't know if you guys saw any of the videos of the quote-unquote uh, the protesters from Israel march. I mean, it, it was, there's a few hundred people there, and they weren't protesting anything. They were just on the Temple Mount. But you see all these quote-unquote Arab guys they won't let them pray there. They won't let them do anything there. And those are the Jordanians because Jordan and the UN has allowed Jordan to control or have, have the policing responsibilities um, for the Temple Mount. And so that's where, so to this day, though Israel is back in the land and are their people, they do not control the Temple Mount. They have the city of Jerusalem, 67, but they gave up the control of the Temple Mount because they knew that there would be no end. I, I think if they had, you know, in retrospect, they would have probably gone ahead and, and just taken it because it ain't like that solved any problems, right? I mean, they've been bombed and everything else by all of the other groups ever since 1967. Shoot, you had the Yom Kippur War shortly after that. And, you know, we, we, we could go on and on. But the point is that now they're back in the land and they've got control. Now this, the reason that this is significant and because, and I keep sort of, sort of putting the bug in your ear that again, I know that most of you are aware of this, but, but a lot of people aren't in particular Sunday morning group uh, of just what's happening. And that's why these things that we keep talking about today, current events are so significant because what you have to remember is that what we would call Orthodox Judaism, so the rabbis, okay? 
uh, uh, Pharisaical Judaism, because there is a biblical Judaism, which is exactly right. But Pharisaical Judaism is nothing but a religion. And they've created more problems than they've solved, not just for themselves, but for the world. They're the ones that Jesus battled with. It was that frame of mind that's the same as, as the rabbis in Jerusalem today. But what you have to understand, and I know that, again, you guys know this, that their prayer, every, uh, uh, in particular, every Passover, right, since, since the Babylonian days, they're waiting for Elijah to show up to usher in Messiah the one that's going to come, the king that's going to come and lead the people and to, you know, sort of to to get control of them and set them free from the nations. That's what they're still waiting for. Now, we know that there's this thing called a New Testament, which has, which is, is renewing the old covenant because, no, what the old covenant or the original covenant established Jesus fulfilled that. He is the Messiah, right? So they understand it, that there are, and, and it's, you got to be careful here because I don't, there's this perspective that they had. We would say they're saying two Messiahs. They would, not, they would not agree with that, though some would. They're waiting for a specific Messiah to bring them healing from sin. See if this all sounds familiar. They call him Ben Yosef, Mashiach Ben Yosef. So the, the Messiah, the son of Joseph. Joseph, the one that God you know, redeemed Israel when they went into the land of Egypt. So it's the redemption contract to save them, to protect them when the famine was great. But they also believe that there's a second aspect to this, and this is Mashiach Ben David. And of course, Messiah, the son of David. So they believe that there's this particular one that's going to deal with the issue of the national sin for the Israelites, but that there's this other guy that's going to come and be the one that is going to uh, be the one that's going to rule them and defeat the nations, right? So that they're back where they were in the days of David, King David. So so you have to understand that from where they stand, they're waiting for this to happen, okay? Now we know from, from both Old and what we call the New Testament that, that the promises that Jesus has left from in particular the Old Testament but is about his coming kingdom. That he is not, you know, there aren't two guys, there's one guy fulfilling two roles. And how you know that this was was the belief system is because this is exactly the perspective that the apostles had. Remember? Remember on, on the, the Olivet Discourse, are you at this time going to establish your kingdom? You see? So their focus, the apostles themselves, and therefore the disciples, in particular the Jewish disciples, We're all anticipating that Jesus had come and was going to establish his kingdom. This is why the mother of James and John said, hey, when you have your kingdom, when it's finally here, when the Romans are dispelled, when everybody's out and the temple is rebuilt, because remember, they didn't have the temple in those days. Um, Well, they, they had one. It was Herod's. But when this is all established and you set up your throne, I want you to let my boys, one of them sit on your right hand and one of them you sit on your left. See, this is why they were these goof, what seems to us to be goofy statements. Why are you going to say, well, what do you mean? Is he going to set up the kingdom? Of course he's not going to set up the kingdom. He's got to be, he's got to be dead and buried and resurrected before, before he can come back and do a second kingdom. Well, you know that because you're, re- you're looking at the past. They didn't know that. They didn't understand it. But it was clearly explained to them. So you see this repeated, uh, this repeated perspective and expectation, probably, of the Jews of Jesus' day. Many said, no, this is the guy, right? We call those the, the larger group the disciples. And of course, those, they're the Talmudim. They're the taught ones, the ones that were being taught by Rabbi Yeshua, by Rabbi Jesus. Then there were the ones specifically sent by him, apostolos, the apostles, okay? The shalach, shalachim is what they, those are the sent ones. And so 
there were two different groups, though all were believers, but each was in a sort of a different category. But they were waiting for him to establish this. And he said, no, no, you're, you're not understanding. This, th- these things are going to happen, but they have to happen in order, in sequence, right? They, 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 they just have to, you know, they're going to follow this. Now, I know that many today teach, we've talked about this, that many teach that this idea that, that the messianic kingdom, that, the, you know, that there was no mention of the nations being a part of that, that's why Paul's ministry, well, that's completely wrong. It's completely wrong. It's absolute tunnel vision to make that statement. And the reason we know that is because what Jesus taught himself. Look, as important, and we know that these, because it's the word of God, okay? So the book of Isaiah, Daniel, Ezekiel, Paul's writings, any of the other apostles, those are obviously because they have a specific role. But the one that we really need to understand is Jesus, okay? There's, I mean, his word, he didn't say everybody else's word is going to stand. He said, my word will stand forever. Heaven and earth is going to pass away, but my words... Well, what is his words? Well, it's the Bible as a whole. So when we look at these things, we, we, we don't need to look to Paul. We, we should, just because it all verifies this. But it's what Jesus said that's significant. Now, we touched, I mentioned this earlier, these guys on the road to Emmaus, after the resurrection. And that's why this is so important. And that's where you're going to see this again, so I won't belabor the point here tonight. But remember what was happening there. They were walking from Jerusalem to this place called Emmaus, right? On this road, they were going south. And as they're walking along, Jesus comes up alongside of them and he hasn't revealed to them who he is. And what does he hear when he gets up there? A bunch of mumbling, groaning, and complaining. You know, like the church today, because Jesus hasn't come back to take us away in the rapture. Yeah, it's exactly the same thing about how bad we got it. Well, we thought we understood he was supposed to come back at trumpets this last year. What happened? You know, it's, it's like, stop. Yeah, that's, that's the problem. So they're walking along and Jesus is like, what are you guys talking about? Well, they're like, haven't you here? You know, you're the only one. And they tell him, well, tell me about what? What? And so they tell him about Jesus. And what's the conclusion of what they're saying? We thought he was the one. You see, they had, they had a a warped perspective. Because what had happened, these were guys that had studied Torah and uh, the, the Tanakh, they had studied it their entire lives. And in the Tanakh, yes, it teaches that Messiah will establish his kingdom. And yes, it will be in Jerusalem. And yes, he will, he will draw all of the nations to himself. But that happens after He pays for the sin, not just of Israel, but for the sin of the world. But if you're a Jew and you've been under oppression by all of these groups that we talked about earlier, the one thing on your mind is going to be the priority, and that's going to be the kingdom. So they missed the redemptive side. Now remember what Jesus does. He calls them essentially knuckleheads. I would say dorks, you dorks. Right? Because what's happened? He said, how can you be so slow to understand all, not some, not most, all that has been written? Where was it written? In the law of Moses and the prophets. Everything about the guy that you're saying, the Messiah, was written there. So why are you confused? Why are you focusing on one aspect of a multifaceted picture of who the Messiah is supposed to be? And so we read that beginning with Moses and the prophets, he explained to them all things about himself, right? Well, what are all things? You know, first coming to redeem, second coming to rule. He included both of those. Paul would take that up and talk about that uh, in the book of Acts. There's, a, there's I don't know, three or four passages in the book of Acts that deal with that. 
And even before Paul, there was Philip who went to the Ethiopian eunuch, right? And the, he goes to the Ethiopian eunuch and, and because the spirit says, hey, I want you to go over there and I want you to hook up with that, that, uh, that chariot there with this guy that's going to Ethiopia. That's a Gentile land, folks. The gospel went to Ethiopia before it went to Europe. We always forget this because, you know, we're from the West. We're from Europe. It was in, the, it was in Ethiopia in Africa long before it went into Europe. Philip's ministry was about 13, 14 years before Paul's. But everybody ignores this. Anyway, so he goes over there, and what does he find when he gets to the chariot? The guy's reading Isaiah. Isaiah 2, Isaiah 11, Isaiah 7, 9? No, Isaiah 53, about the suffering Messiah. And we all know the story. This is where he, Philip goes, hey, do you, well, you know, I'm hearing you read this. Do you understand what you're reading? And the guy says, no, I can't understand. There's nobody here to explain it to me. So in essence, yeah, can you help me out here, chief? And so what does Philip do? Starting at that passage, then he uses all of the scriptures to explain the things of Jesus. So, so there was this, this mentality all along that the Messiah would come and establish his kingdom. But that would only fall, follow his coming to deal with the national sin of Israel and the global sin of the nations, right? So his ministry, Jesus' ministry, was to reverse what had happened in Genesis chapter 6 and followed closely by the Tower of Babel. So... So this is the perspective. Now, why all of that's important for us today? Because unlike any other time through history, this has been why I've been driving this home. This Jubilee and this, uh, this uh, Shemitah this year were, are, are unique. There hasn't been any like them. During this period of time, and right as they're coming to a conclusion, and again, I mentioned this, and I know many of us don't understand, um, but the, the Jews, you could go on YouTube and watch it if you want. Uh, there's several uh, videos of it um, that they found five red heifers. Now, the whole red heifer, it's a red, it's a red female cow, right? That's what it amounts to. And it, it has to be absolutely perfect. So, so they have finally, and if you've known about this stuff, because I've been following this obviously for years, they've thought they've had them repeatedly, but it, it turns out there's a black hair. Well, it's disqualified. A single black hair, the thing's disqualified. So they brought five thinking that they're perfect, but now they're in Israel being inspected by the Kohen, the priests, to see if one, at least one of the five qualify. It appears so far that at, you know, we haven't heard anything more because they just got there. Obviously, this is a painstaking experience. But, but the whole point, reason that this is important is from a Jew is that you cannot get the priests ready to minister in the temple without the ashes of a red heifer. A red heifer had to be sacrificed on the burnt offering, altar of burnt offering. Remember, we looked, talked about that last time in the tabernacle. And then its ashes had to be mixed with some water and some oil and stuff. And this is what consecrated all of the, the, uh, the furnishings of the temple, but also purified the high priest, Aaron being the first. So from a Jewish perspective, now think about this. You've got this unique Shemitah and Jubilee. You've got five red heifers. You have, for some number of years now, had all of the furnishings prepared. I hope you guys know that. For probably 30 years, maybe even more, they have had uh, the, 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 alt, the burnt alt, altar that's going to be used in the new temple. It's built. It's ready to go. The, the laver's ready to go. The menorah's ready to go. The table for the showbread is ready to go. The altar of incense is ready to go. 
Everything is ready to go. They probably have all of the poles and the, the, the uh, you know, tapestry and all of that stuff to go along with it. They have it all. It's all ready. It's been ready. You can go on and look at the high priest vestures. Just go on, Google it, look it up on YouTube. It's all been ready. The problem is they still don't have the temple mount, so they can't build their tavern. They can't build their temple, right? They, so, so they can't, there's no reason to have all of these things because they can't get in there. You see? So they, they've had to sort of wait. And in the meantime, they have gathered a whole group of descendants from the tribe of Levi, right? We know some of these people today, they have, they have that somewhere in their name, typically, if they're, especially if they're from Israel, or even their last name, but Kohen is priest. So people that have the last name Kohen typically have something to do with the priest line. And so they've gone through all of this stuff, done all of these tests and all of this. And so they've identified a group of, of people that are direct descendants of Levi. Now I have not verified this, so I'm just going to throw this out there. It could be wrong. Maybe some of you already know this. But as I understand that they have found a marker in blood tests for uh, that there's something in this particular line that identifies it as being different. So in other words, you can't show up from the tribe of Simeon and say, your ancestry goes back to Judah. They take your blood, they go, yeah, you know, you're not a Judite. Now, I have not verified that. It's just not something I really thought about. But I've seen this stuff in the past to where the, the actual descendants of what we call Levites, right? The priestly line, that, uh, that they, there's a specific marker, something in their blood, which is different than anyone else. So they've identified this group of people, or I'm assuming that's where this group of people come from, and they have been, been training them for, for years on how to do all of the temple duties from, you know, from the coals on the altars and the incense and the, you know, all of the stuff. They've, they've all been trained on that. And again, you can, all, you can Google this, check it all out. It's all, it's all right there. But you see, they've been waiting and waiting. And now they have these heifers. And all of a sudden, you see, this, this year, for them, 52, 83, is it? Um, but it, whatever it is. Uh, and so they... So now you've got all of this stuff. You've got these red heifers and you've got, you've got, uh, uh, you know, you've got all these implements and so you're ready to go. But you've got to have, you know, you've got to have the ultimate high priest. You've got to have the Messiah. Guess who just showed up? You see, so this doesn't no bearing for you and I. We know who our high priest is, right? There's one mediator between man and God. His name's Jesus, Okay. So this has nothing to do with the church. What I'm trying to show is when you start adding up all of these things that we're talking about, and in particular this, in this specific jubilee, then what you're looking at is sort of the dominoes are starting to line up for this idea that there's a new temple. Now think about this. Israel, in particular the Orthodox, know full well that if they go in and try to take control of the Temple Mount, what's going to happen? Literally all hell is going to break loose, right? Did you guys just see again the UN? You know, we talked about this I don't know, probably a month ago or whatever. The UN decided, well, the, the Temple Mount doesn't belong to Israel. Why do you think the, the nations are doing that? You, you really think it's th these intelligent politicians in the United Nations? These people are dumber than a box of rocks. There's something behind this. You think? Because the enemy knows full well what's happening. So he's going to manipulate these weak-minded people like uh, Obi-Wan Kenobi does in the first Star Wars. right? He's going to manipulate them to say, without any common sense at all, with all the archaeology and all of the stuff that says that this place belongs to the Jews, always has, always will, but we're not good. That's not the Jews. It belongs to the Palestinians. So they gave it to the Palestinians. 
Well, did you just see just a couple of days ago, now the UN is demanding that, you, that uh, Israel, who's never claimed, by the way, that they have nuclear weapons, <laughs> right? But now the UN, literally, was it two days ago, maybe three days ago, the UN passed to the General Assembly. Again, a box of rocks, because that's all these people are. And they just now demanded now that Israel gives up its nuclear arms. <laughs> to which the, 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 the Jews are going, yeah, no. I mean, you're right, but this is how stupid this is. This is how foolish things are. Yeah, we want you, you have to give up your nuclear weapons. You're the threat in the area. We'll ignore Iran. <laughs> We'll ignore Russia and NATO. Those guys aren't... Stop looking over there. We're talking to you. You have to give up your nuclear weapons and then you have to let us come in with our international... Uh, what is the IAEA? Whatever it is. The, uh, the Atomic Agency, right? The ones that are, you know, the watchdogs because they did a wonderful job in Iran. <laughs> I mean, this is how stupid this is. But anyway, so... So again, if you're a Jew, based on all of the stuff that we've had, and all of a sudden you've got all of these things and the dominoes are starting to line up, and then a quote-unquote Messiah shows up, you're not going to try to take back the Temple Mount unless who is here? Your Messiah. Oh. Oh, you see what's happening? There's something big and different. Now, what I touched on, and I hope some of you guys went and looked at Shlomo Biri, right? Rav Shlomo Biri. This guy's, what is he, 33 years old now? And they keep, things keep popping up. He's doing more miracles. Now, as I, last count I saw, he's probably done more since, but the last count I saw were five bona fide messianic miracles. That's why they're all lit up about him. And like I said that Sunday morning, when he showed up at 13 years old, which is, by the way, which is why he's, he's called the Yanukha, the child, right? So when he showed up to the religious leaders of his day, Jesus, we've heard this before, he just baffled the religious of the day with his knowledge. Yes, ma'am? I, I don't want to take credit for this. It was him. Uh -huh. thought of it, but how can they believe this guy's the Messiah when he wears glasses? That's a good question. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, that's a good question. Why doesn't he just heal himself? I used to have that question with all these guys, the name and claim it guys at the prison when I was a chaplain at the prison and stuff. And they were like, you know, I'd come in one day and I'd have a kind of a cold and they go, whoa, brother, you don't have the faith to get in. And I said, yeah, whoa, whoa, wait a second. You're telling me about my faith and you better get that medicine off your nose there, boy. Where's your faith? And they just look at you big eyed like, oh, yeah. I actually said this is a guy in Belize too. Yeah. Yeah, you guys had your, your faith thing so you never get sick. Kenneth Hagen, <laughs> Kenneth Copeland. Anyway, these guys and stuff like that as they get older and their chests are now hanging over their belts <laughs> and their hair, why isn't their faith kept them fit? Why is their bellies and the skin sagging? Why do they keep having to have facial reconstruction to keep their lips from drooping? Why is their hair... well? You know, if you really saw it, why is it all falling out? Because you're under the curse, dude. So stop with the you don't have enough faith thing or you wouldn't be sick. That's just stupid. Just dumb to even make that statement. That's ridiculous. Anyway, so, so these guys, so now you think about this. So for the first time, right? They've the, sort of all of the ducks are now in a row. Not quite, but they're getting there. And if there was ever a time for the nation of Israel and the military might and excellence that they have, I mean, they're like, no matter what anybody tells you, they're, well, they're up at the top of the heap where we used to be. I'm not sure we're there now with the generals that we have now, but uh, the commanders and stuff. But they're, these, these guys, they're amazing. What they can do is absolutely stunning, just stunning. So you've got all of these things in a row and you've got this military and you've got the whole world that's still coming against you and all of a sudden your Messiah is there. If there was ever a time for them to feel like it's time, this would be it. Now, does this make him the Antichrist? No, it does not. Okay? 
Because the Antichrist, according to the way we understand Scripture, we're going to get into this in our Sunday morning with Daniel 9, is going to come out of, I believe, he's the Assyrian. He's called the Assyrian. Uh, and so he's going to come out of, again, this, this, this area that would have, they, have, would, they would have known as Yavan, which is Syria, that area and stuff like that. He's, he's, he's going to come out of that. But he also has a religious guy alongside of him. And that's where I'm wondering. Nobody knows this. And if they tell you they do, they're lying to you. Nobody knows. Who is this guy? I don't know. But when I look at this one world leader, the Antichrist, a modern day Nimrod, literally, when I look at him and what he does and you know, how do you make an agreement with Israel if you're an Israelite? You see what I'm saying? Um, or make a covenant. So, but he's got a right-hand man that's called a false prophet. There's a religious aspect to this. Now, I know many think it's Rome and, you know, uh, and stuff, but I, I, I just, I don't know. I mean, yes, I can see things in that, but then there are other things. So the reality of it is, I don't know, neither do you, and neither does anyone else, no matter what YouTube, how many YouTube videos they put out. Okay? We just don't know. But we can look at the scripture, like I keep saying on Sunday mornings, and not predict, but calculate. We can calculate. The problem we have with our calculation goes back to what I said before, the calendar. You see? Again, I, I shared this. I, you know, I don't want to get into this on a Sunday morning because we have people there that, you know, they're, they're newer to the faith and you can't... But this group, you guys are so much more educated <laughs> and highly intelligent. So it's a little easier to do that. But understand, this calendar thing is huge. Okay? We know there's no... Get rid of all calendar. Who, who cares what calendar it is? We know there's a Moedim. Okay? There's a first month for the, the, what we call the spring feast. There's, uh, there's the, the, the uh, sixth month uh, fifth month, I'm sorry, which is uh, Pentecost, and there's the uh, did I already say the first month? And the seventh month. There's the first, the seventh, and the sixth month. All right, that's the Moedim. Who cares what calendar it is? God said these are my times. The problem is, how do you calculate which month is, is which? If you don't know which calendar you're on, that's where the problem comes in. Notice I said calculate. Okay? Because what we have to understand, and you can go online and you can get into, look at all of this stuff and this debate over this Enochian calendar, the calendar of Enoch found in the Dead Sea Scrolls, all of these pro, yes, this is the calendar that was used, and yada, da, 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 you know, and stuff. And these are the reasons, and it's, a, it's, it's intriguing. I, I touched on it with you guys and showed you it's very intriguing. Um, and then there are guys that said, no, 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 um, this, you know, the original calendar is right. Well, there's problems with both of these folks, <laughs> okay? There are problems with this because what we now call the Gregorian calendar, if you walk it back, the Gregorian calendar that we follow was established by Pope, Pope Gregory. But what was Pope Gregory doing? Well, he was reestablishing something that had been set during the days of Byzantine under Constantine. There was the Julian calendar. I think I got that straight. So going back, well, what was the Julian calendar? Well, it was an update from a previous calendar. Well, what calendar predated the Julian calendar? The calendar that none other than Antiochus Epiphanes established, the one Daniel talks about. He's going to seek to change the times and the seasons. So the original change from whatever the biblical calendar was Antiochus, right, the madman, he changed it. There's no debating this. This is historical fact that this guy, this Seleucid ruler in the line of Greece and Syria, because that's the area that they were primarily in, that he changed the calendar so the question is, there's no question. So to say that the Gregorian is the established one, okay. But my question is, look, this guy changed the calendar. The one that we are now saying is okay. 
What calendar did he change it from? Do you see the problem? Well, it's the Enoch calendar. How do you know that? You don't. You don't. You see the problem you get when you get into this? So when you start saying the Feast of Trumpets is going to be the rapture, you know, and then there's, there's you know, the, the, the uh, uh, Daniel 70th week. Well, you're going off of a Julian calendar. Are you sure that's the calendar that God goes off of? We don't know that, do we? That's why we don't predict. We calculate. We're told to calculate. So the question then becomes, for me, take it or leave it, which one did Jesus follow? Well, it appears on the surface that he followed the, what we would now call the, you know, the Julian calendar and, the, and then by extension the Gregorian calendar. He followed that. Oh, but there's a couple of issues that come in. Do you remember Passover? What, what is, it? is it in John? Or maybe it's Mark. Anyway, one of the Gospels, I wasn't going to talk about all this. Obviously, I'm, this is, I'm winging it here as we talk. Um, but, but in one of the Gospels, the, 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 the author says, and when the Jews celebrate Passover. Think about that for a second. You say, well, that's a gospel writer and he's writing to Greeks. And so, yeah, 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 that, no. <laughs> if it's going to say, this is what, you know, uh, Eloi, Eloi, Lassa Machlebachthani, right? My, which is being interpreted. We don't have which is being interpreted. It just says there was a Passover and the Jews celebrate the Passover. And then Jesus was, you know, there was something else. So that begs the question, maybe he celebrated the Passover on a different day than they celebrated in his day. You see? This is what we're talking about. I don't know, and neither does anyone else. And if they tell you they do, they're, they're, they're full of bunky-hunky. Okay? No, they don't. Nobody knows. Because there was a change. It changed somehow, some way. We do not know what that was. You can say it was the Enoch calendar. It may very well be. Whatever it was, whatever he changed from became the calendar that we look at today. That's why, just from a scriptural perspective, the 6,000 years that man has on earth, and then you look at the calendar that the Jews use, and it's, what is it, 50, I can never get this, remember, 5873, I think, is this year. Well, if there's 6,000, you mean there's another 100 and some odd years to go? But if you look at the Enoch calendar, you're in, you know, 5,900 something. You see the problem? There's a danger in this. Do you know what we know, regardless of what calendar it is, that God has a fixed time? If we can't identify the others, then let's celebrate it where it is. It's the same thing with our Christmas. Jesus was not born in December on the 25th. He was born on Tabernacles in September. Period. Okay? We know that from the Scripture. Where did the December come from? It came from, uh, from the Byzantine area with Constantine and, and then on into the papacy. They are the ones that picked that date. And it's the date that we're all familiar with. So are we wrong to do it? Yeah, I mean, if you're looking at it from what it's supposed to represent with the living trees and all that, you know, the Christmas tree and the holly and all of that kind of junk, well, then you got a problem. But if you're using that day to celebrate the birth of the Messiah into this world, stop worrying about it. And don't go toilet paper people's house who are celebrating Christmas on the 25th of December. Okay, that's just dumb. So, but anyway, so you, you, you see, these are the issues that you get in. When, and believe me, we've only scratched the surface. This is, this is the challenge, the, really ultimately the frustration of, of studying stuff like this. And, and I, I don't want to draw any conclusions. What I do know is that a, moon, the, the, that a new moon starts a month. That's what I do know. You know what I find interesting? Let me backtrack just a little bit. Do you know the one thing that has never been changed? The seven days in the week. Think about it. That, to me, I'm just, I would, you know, was thinking through this, I'm thinking, we, we don't know the, what month as it is, but yeah, we know a new moon starts a month, but is this the sixth month or is this the seventh month? Well, Gordon, this calendar is the seventh, according to that calendar, is the fifth month. 
Oh, but you know what? It's never changed. The first day, second day, third day, fourth day, fifth day, sixth day, and Shabbat. It has never changed. I find that intriguing. Isn't it interesting that God said, remember the Shabbat to keep it unique? And he was going to make sure that they kept it unique. So all of these years, the possibility is, and I'm not saying it's correct, I'm saying it's a possibility, tabernacles, all of the, all of the Moedim, or we've been, the, the Jews, which we picked up on, which I keep showing up here, it's all wrong. Do you realize that? That's what we're saying here. Now here's the thing. Who cares? Who cares? Now, Jesus did fulfill Passover to the day, little hint, to the, as the calendar that we understand it, which is why I tend to lean that direction. Whatever uh, Antiochus did, I think somehow God got his way anyways, because Jesus fulfilled it on the 14th day of the first month. He was buried on the 15th day of the first month, and he was resurrected on first fruits of the first month. That's enough for me. But there's still all of these arguments out there. So, uh, you know, so, but this is the stuff that you get into. So I'm saying all that to say you see all of these things happening. And now, all of a sudden, calendars are becoming an issue. And world leaders and the world is now in a position it has never been in before. Right? So, so that's where I want to say, you know what? The heck with all the rest of that. Let's just look at Messiah. What are the promises of Messiah? What, what is the reality? Because the scripture is very clear on that. We may not know an exact date who the crud cares. When it's time for him to come and to, to take his bride out before he pours his wrath on this world, he will do it when it's time. And it doesn't matter what calendar I use, you use, or anyone else uses. He's going to do it on his time. And so, so that's the thing that we can trust in. Because we know that those things are taught in the scripture. We know trumpets. We understand what it is. Even if we don't know the exact date, we understand what it is. We understand Yom Kippur. We understand Sukkot, which is tabernacles. We understand all of that. We understand that there's an invasion coming from the north on the nation of Israel and the Ezekiel 38 thing and stuff. And if we've never seen anything like what we're seeing now as far as that lining up. And that means that the 70th week is right on its tail. We know those things will happen. Even if we don't know the exact date, it doesn't change a thing. Our God is God and will accomplish his purposes when his, in his time. Not mine, yours, or anyone on YouTube. Okay? So, so that's kind of, you know, that I have, you know, that just, I just sort of rambling on there. I, I know I get hard, to, Marie always says, you, it's hard to follow, you know, and it's like, I don't know, I, they just keep yapping. So, um, but, but I, you know, we, we, there's an actual study that's going to point us in this direction, and that's what we we're hopefully going to see tonight, which we're obviously not, because now it's time to go home. So, um, so anyway, so uh, I know it's a little odd, um, but it's kind of funny. A couple of other things before we get. You're going to start hearing things more now. They've always been around, but they're going to be elevated, okay? How many of you guys have seen this whole thing come out now about the canon of Scripture with the council at Nicaea? All these guys, especially the ones that are the critics of the Bible. You know, Bill Maher and all these guys, Joe Rogan, all these guys that have these talk shows. And I, I kind of like these guys for some of the stuff they say, but then the others, they're, they're like the UN. They're dumber than a box of rocks. Because they're all out there putting out, and there's guys that got videos out there. And you Christians trust your Bible, and you don't even know, you know, we call it the canon, right? The, the established... You know, and it wasn't until the Council of Nicaea that the canon was established and stuff like that. Don't believe these people because they're morons. And I mean morons. Because the canon was never the issue nor discussed at the Council of Nicaea. Never. Have you ever read the Council? That's what I would say to these guys. Ah, oh, so you read the Council of Nicaea. What the, the, well, no. Well, where did you hear that from? Well, I heard it from so-and-so. You know where most people heard it from? Dan Brown. 
Remember the movie? Uh, what was the movie? Where it was, uh, you know, it was about, about the Council of Nicaea. And there was one vote that gave Jesus his deity. Just stop. But people saw a movie. Millions of people watched the movie. And so now everybody knows. And they're on their program saying, well, the, you know, the Christian church, there's all sorts of other writings that you Christians decided shouldn't be a part of your Bible. And it all happened at the Council of Nicaea. Well, you're a moron and you need to stop talking because you don't know what you're talking about. That never happened. Never happened. But nobody will tell you that. I will. That's not what, ta what happened to the Council of Nicaea. There was an argument of this group saying, Jesus is not God. There was an argument over here saying, Jesus is God. In other words, it was about the deity of Jesus Christ. And there was no one vote decision as if it mattered any stinking ways. That's what the Council of Nicaea was. The canon never entered the picture. So don't listen to these people that tell you that. That's just one of many. Why am I telling you? Signs of the times. Now there's all this threats about now people or kids are going to have to start having therapy now because their Christian parents told them, and in this they're correct, that the Feast of Trumpets a few weeks ago was the rapture. Don't worry about it, children. The Lord is taking us out of here. The rapture is going to happen. Go on YouTube and look at all of them that were guaranteeing, guaranteeing the rapture on tabernacles just a couple of, or tabern uh, trumpets just a couple of weeks ago. So what does the critic do? He takes that and says, so now all of these kid, kids of the Christian parents, now these kids are all distraught because the, the rapture never happened and now they got to have counseling. And then you Christians tell us we shouldn't be teaching your children CRT because it's a lie. They got a point, don't they? You bet they do. Because the church is so about this stuff that we've forgotten the word of God. We're more interested in our interpretation of the word of God. I don't want to do that. So this, is, this goes on. These are the signs of the times. Many are falling away from the church. Why? For things like this. Well, the, the church has kept things hidden. We have the gospel of Thomas. Why isn't it included? Because it's a garbage book. The book of Abraham, you know, the book of Abraham, oh, it's a garbage book. There's a reason that the early church didn't put it in there. Hello. Even the book of Enoch. So we could go on and on. Signs of the times. So this, this doubt. Why is this stuff coming up? Because people in the church are abandoning their faith. Is that not precisely what the word of God said would happen? Yes. Do you know Why? Because they think the Council of Nicaea determined the canon of Scripture. Most Christians probably believe that as well. You abandoned the church. They've been hiding things from us all along. You see, we, we could go on and on. So, enough rambling. I've worked up a serious hunger now. <laughs> so, sorry about the confusion. It was you know, I had fun. <laughs> I hope you guys did as well. <laughs> All right, thank you. I appreciate that. All right, let's pray. Father, thanks for this evening, Lord. And you know, uh, it, it's it's a lot of it, a lot of fun, at least for me, to talk about these things because once again, it just shows what how goofy we all of us are, and how great and awesome you are. The contrast couldn't be further. God, help us never to listen to anybody, even that guy, this guy right here, flapping his jaws. We need to trust you. And you have told us what is happening in your word. So give us the courage, Lord. Give us the tenacity to study your word, even if it makes us uncomfortable. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.